them in order to win them. The Bible says He came into the world not to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. Hallelujah. Last week we talked about forgiveness. And we got about halfway through. Today we're going to pick up on that and continue on. Had several people this week get in touch with us, letting us know what, how much the sermon touched them and how the Lord blessed them through the Word. So we're glad for that. Yeah. It's my prayer that continues to do so because this is very, very important. Mm -hmm. It's important for you. It's important for me. It's important for the entire body of Christ. Last week, I read you this Scripture, Ephesians the second chapter, in the second verse. Ephesians the second chapter, in the second verse, and I'm not going to review much, probably about five minutes, and then we're going to get into what we didn't get to last week. So if you're out there listening and you missed last week's sermon, I, I encourage you to request the CD or the cassette or to go on our website and listen to the sermon. <clears throat> The Bible says in Ephesians, the second chapter, the second verse, and it's talking about us before we were saved. This is the Apostle Paul teaching to the church in Ephesus. He says, Wherein in time past, he's talking to the church, you walked according to the course of this world. Talking about before we met Jesus, before we were born again, before we were what we call saved. Amen. It says, you walked according to the course of the world, according to the prince of the power of the air. See, you had a different master then. You had a different Lord then. i got news for you today. I know some people think they can straddle the fence, but you're either on one side or you're on the other. You're either hot or you're cold because lukewarm won't do. Amen? You're either serving one or the other. Jesus looked at them one time and said, you're, you're, you are of your father, the devil. So in times past, before we were born again, before we were saved, before the salvation experience in our life, we were children of the world. We walked according to the world and we walked according to the prince of the power of the air, which is Satan. The spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. So in other words, we at one time were children of disobedience. But we're not supposed to be that way now. Amen? Among whom also we all had our conversation in times past. I told you last week, I won't hit on it much this morning, but our conversation is supposed to be different today. You're not supposed to go around telling the same old dirty jokes you used to tell before you got before you met Jesus. Amen? That'll preach. Because I've heard, listen, I've shouted at people on Sunday night and then went out with them on Monday morning and I couldn't tell the difference between them and the unsaved people that I worked with. Simply because they went to church on Sunday and shouted the aisle, they thought they were all right. But if we find ourselves continuing to, not know all of us, are, none of us are perfect, but if we find ourselves continuing to walk in these ways, we might need to do a spiritual checkup and find out, hey, something ain't right somewhere. Our conversation in times past, in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh, and of the mind, this is what I want to get to. The nature, and we're by nature the children of wrath. And we're talking about the difference between being saved and unsaved. The difference between being a child of God and not being a child of God. Before we were saved, we were children of disobedience. Before we were born again, we were children of wrath. But brethren, these things ought not be so once you are born again. Once we are born again, whenever we do begin to see those things in our life, the Holy Spirit begins to prick our heart and begins to deal with us. And then we're supposed to seek His face and turn to the only the only source of deliverance and overcoming power and say, Lord, I put you in my hands. I don't want to be this way. Do you know how many times we're angry and we're, dis and we're spiteful and we have wrath, yet we don't find ourselves on our knees saying, Lord, I don't like that feeling. Most of us don't. How many people like feeling angry at people? I don't like it. I don't like it whenever I have bitterness towards someone. I don't like the feeling that that brings. And that causes me to be on my knees and say, God, I don't like this. I don't like the way I feel. Take it out of me. Help me to be more like you and less of me. Once we are born again, Paul tells us in Colossians, the third chapter of the 13th verse, we are supposed to forbear one another and forgive one another. And if any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also... Do you. Amen. 
Now we went over them scriptures last week. And basically what we talked about was that we used to be unforgiving. We used to be children of wrath. But today we're not supposed to be that way. If we're born again, bought and paid for by the blood of Jesus, a child of God, today we are supposed to be forgiving. And we learned that forgiving is a choice. When the disciples came to Him and said, Lord, teach us how to pray. In what they call the Lord's Prayer, which was actually not... He was telling the disciples how to pray. We probably would have called it the disciples' prayer. He said, when you pray, you should pray like this. Our Father... And most of us know this. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be Thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Did you hear that? When Jesus taught His disciples how to pray, they came to Him and He said, Lord, teach us. Teach us to pray. Sometimes I think whenever we've got the lights down around here and we're down praying and the silence is deafening, I think, Lord, teach us to pray. Teach us how to pray. I want to give you the benefit of the doubt and, and, and suppose that you're sitting there in silent meditation and praying in silence. But if you ain't, somebody needs to teach us how to pray. Amen? And the disciples came to Him and said, Teach us how to pray. And He said, These are the things you should pray. And one of the things that He told them, Pray that you forgive others. <coughs> as I have forgiven you. Lord, help me to forgive my debtors as you have forgave, forgiven my debts. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. We learned last week that there was a man that owed his master, what was it, a trillion dollars? A bunch of money. And he begged him for forgiveness and his master forgave him. And that same servant who had been forgiven of so much, went out and found him someone that owed him 15 bucks and grabbed him around the neck and said, give me my money. And this man begged him for forgiveness like he had his master. And instead of him forgiving like his master had forgiven him, he laid hold of him and threw him into jail. He wouldn't forgive him. Oh, we can sit here this morning and we can shake our head. We think, my goodness, what a hypocrite this man was. Yeah, most of the church ain't much different. We have been forgiven of our sins, our trespasses, our transgressions, our iniquities. I'd ask you to raise your hand this morning, but I bet there ain't a one of us in here this morning who hasn't had a problem forgiving someone. Really? Amen? Just as this man, and Jesus goes on to tell them at the end of that, so likewise shall my heavenly Father do to you if ye from your hearts forgive not everyone his brother their trespasses. Forgive. Oh, it's important. How important is it, Brother Billy? Because the Bible teaches us that if we can't forgive others, that blocks God's forgiveness from us. If we go around with that bitterness, it hurts us. Corey Tim Boom, I told you last week, a survivor of the Nazi concentration camps. She said that forgiveness is to set a prisoner free and to realize the prisoner was you. That's why you don't like the way it makes you feel because it has you in bondage. None of us like the way that bondage feels because forgiveness will loose you from the hold that that person or those actions that that person did have on you. No longer will you feel that way. And I'm not saying you'll always think, oh, just get a warm, lovey feeling about it. Oh, but you'll be able to bring yourself to pray. The Bible says pray for those that despitefully use you. Do good to them that do bad to you is what it teaches us. Oh, these things are strange to the church today. We can understand wrath. We can understand revenge. But we just can't understand forgiving people that we don't think deserves our forgiveness. But it's supposed to be a part of our walk with the Lord. Forgiveness. Well, Brother Billy, I'm just not getting a lot with this. Maybe you don't want to hear what the Lord's saying. He's saying in Hebrews 12 and 15, we read this last week, looking diligently lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Bitterness is not satisfied with just a little, just being a little bit in your life because it grows. 
it gets bigger and it gets bigger and it gets bigger and it tries to it finally wraps itself around you and chokes the life out of you. I told you last week that there are medical studies that show that people who can bring themselves to forgive, they benefit from that physically and mentally and emotionally because bitterness and unforgiveness and hatred affect you in your physical body, in your mental body, in your spiritual body. We talked about a woman who saw a man shoot down her family. Yet she was able to bring herself to forgive that man. And whenever she did that, this man in seeing that forgiveness saw her God. Did you hear that this morning? This man in seeing her forgiveness saw her God. We talked about Jacob and Esau and how that Jacob was so afraid to go back and face his brother because he knew that his brother hated him. He knew that his brother held all this against him, that the dealings that they had over the birthright. But when he got there, he didn't find anger. He didn't find bitterness. He found forgiveness in the face of his brother Esau. And in finding that, he looks at Esau and he says, I have seen as it were the face of God in your face. Why? Because he had forgiven. We learned last week that in the face of forgiveness, people see the face of God. We learned last week that if they see the face of God in your forgiveness, I asked you this question last week, I'll ask you again today. What do they see? Whose face do they see in your bitterness? Whose face do they see in your unforgiveness and your wrath and your malice? It ain't God's. Amen. So Esau and his brother had this re reuniting. and He finds forgiveness and Jacob says, Therefore I have seen thy face as though I had seen the face of God. As though I had seen the face of God. Now I read this, I think before last week. But someone posted this quote. I don't know who it was it originally said, but it said, Your life helps paint your neighbor's picture of God. Think about that. Your life helps paint your neighbor's picture of God. The Bible teaches us in the book of Romans, Recompense to no man evil for evil, but provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Did you hear that? Avenge not yourselves. It teaches us there. It says if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him drink. For in doing so, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Do good to those that despitefully use you. When your enemy's thirsty, don't laugh at him and kick him down, but offer him a cup of water. When your enemy's hungry, offer him something to eat. And in doing so, these coals of fire that it's talking about is Holy Ghost conviction. That gets on people whenever they say, wait a minute, after all I've done to you, you're going to do good to me? After all that I've done to you, you're forgiving me? We talked about the centurion, the soldier that stood by the foot of the cross. And when he seen Jesus say, Father, forgive them. The people that had beat him and spit on him. He said, surely, as, con as conviction gripped his heart, he said, surely this was the Son of God. Why? Because he's seen the face of God in the face of forgiveness. Your enemy sees the face of God whenever you reach out with a cup of water when he's thirsty. Whenever you give him a handful of food whenever he's hungry. And he can't deal with that. He can't understand that. Like I told you, the centurion soldier, he could have understood Jesus spitting on him. He could have understood Jesus cursing him. He could have understood Jesus saying, God, call down the 